All right. Well, hi everyone. Thank you for joining. This is, I believe this is session five in our uh, series of conversations called Making Data Science Work. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Venkata and I are from Scribble Data, as you know. Um, we are a feature store company in the ML engineering space. And uh, today's topic is experimentation in data science. And this is a theme I, I think that's been uh, resonating for the last couple of sessions, whether we wanted it or not, which is the science in data science aspect of it, you know, which refers effectively to the process of developing some, some sort of a systematic understanding of the world. And, uh, you know, there are direct implications again on how people are able to, to take what they see in experiments and actually implement them. That actually gives a, a bump up to top line, bottom line, whatever it is. So today we are joined by uh, two people that are, that for whom this is sort of their lifeblood. Uh, so thank you very much for, for joining us, Paul and Bhargava. Let me just quickly introduce you. So Paul is, a, is the co-founder of AMP, which is a SaaS product that takes customer communication and turns that into a business growth engine. Paul had earlier co-founded and was chief data officer of Paysense, a consumer lending and mobile fintech startup in India, which was acquired in 2019 for a ridiculous amount of $185 million. Um, the other roles he, that he's held include chief product officer at DT1, when he was the VP of data science at housing.com and principal data scientist at Teradata as well. He has an academic research background in computational social science and began his career building statistical inference systems for the U.S. Department of Defense. Paul is also an advisor at an early stage VC fund in India and an angel investor in startups in Asia and the U.S. Bhargava Subramaniam is the co-founder and CTO of uh, Binay's. Bhargava, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. All right, wonderful. And Bhargava has spent the last 17 years helping businesses, both large and small, use data and algorithms to build a moat. He's worked on large-scale machine learning problems in transportation, in banking, software, and networking products. He's a trained statistician academically, having done his master's at the University of Maryland in College Park. And at his startup, Binay's, he's focused on helping small and medium-sized e-commerce companies improve conversion rates. At an individual capacity, he mentors people in their data science and entrepreneurial journey, which is sort of fodder for the kind of people that we like to have on our podcast and on, on our meetup. So thank you both, Paul and Bhargava, for joining us. And uh, today's topic, as we, as we just mentioned, was about experimentation. And, uh, you know, so many questions come to mind when we think about experimentation. And even earlier when we were talking about this, um, you know, from the setting up of the problems all the way to execution, there were so many rabbit holes that we thought that we could go down. Um, and I would love to get started right at the outset. Before I do that, one quick note to everybody listening in. As you know, this, uh, this webinar, this, this meetup streams across multiple platforms. Some of you are on Zoom with us. Some of you are watching this on YouTube, on Twitter. Uh, we are watching your comments. We are looking at your questions. So feel free to, to Chime in with your questions and we'll weave them in uh, as soon as it's appropriate or when it makes sense in the context of this conversation. All right, with that, Paul and Bhargava, let me start by something fairly foundational. Um, why, why experimentation? What is the benefit to a business, to a data science function? Why should they think about experimentation? I know this is fairly basic, but just to set uh, just to get everybody on the same page about what we mean, uh, I'd love either of you to, to take this question and, and answer it. Okay, maybe I'll go. Thanks, thanks for having Please. me here. Yeah. Uh, so if you think about traditional ways in which you can understand customers itself, uh, so you could do quantitative, qualitative studies, you can do ethnographic study, you can send surveys, uh, or as the current trend is, you can use uh, data to make some trends, machine learning models and understand. Uh, all of these things are either backward looking or are things which uh, in, in some sense done at a setting which is not equivalent to real life. So if you do usability study, you're getting them into a room and then you're learning and understanding about it, which may not be the same that translates into the wild. Uh, Experimentation provides us with a set of tools and techniques that helps you understand the user and understand your business better in the wild, in real life mm -hmm. settings. That's one that's extremely critical for any business. 
Uh, the second thing is, especially with, with the ways, I mean, I've seen some of the previous versions and the way uh, all the machine learning models are currently done, they're so backward looking. Mm -hmm. This is also pretty much like what uh, you guys do in Scribble also in Feature Store. Uh, I, I, would, I would probably say that people, the data keeps changing over time and you need to have a better model about your customers, which impacts your business model. That's extremely important and critical. And that's something that uh, I firmly believe that experimentation is the way to go. And uh, it's pretty sad that people don't talk enough about it, but I think that would be the next big wave in my, in my opinion. Paul, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that was a, is a great intro. I, uh, I would just say that, um, that it like, like analytics and computational thinking and the other terms we use when, we, when we're talking about data science, experimentation is a pretty broad term. And so, um, and so I think some of the confusion and some of the uncertainty around it comes from that broadness, that breadth of what it refers to. And, and in a way, like why, why should businesses care about experimentation? Well, it's, it's really because why should humans care about experimentation? And humans care about experimentation because it's one of the fundamental ways we learn from when we're little. So I, I have a 10 month old baby and uh, it's amazing. He's constantly experimenting, you know, everything is in his mouth um, and, and he loves putting new things in his mouth, right? And so um, we, we start doing that as infants and, and then we continue to do it throughout, throughout our lives. And, and the science of experimentation or doing it systematically is just a way of taking that core capability and making it scale and making it more trustworthy and making it more reliable um, and safer and, 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 and better at managing risk in order to achieve our ends and our goals. And, um, and so I think where, where the opportunity is, as Bhargava mentioned, uh, in terms of the opportunity for businesses um, and, and where the broader trends in industry are going is that there's so much more that can be captured, so much more value that can be generated from doing experimentation systematically and robustly and rigorously as a part of practice, uh, rather than a sort of a de facto informal thing that we do. If you look at the uh, word experimentation and the science and so on, right? Uh, the model that conjures, uh, that comes to our mind is that of academic uh, work that goes on for many years and who knows what the outcome will be at some point in time. Uh, it, can you comment on the, the economics of uh, the experimentation in uh, enterprises? The economics of, can you just uh, elaborate a little bit more what you mean there? So, uh, for example, I mean, uh, th there was this, I think um, in your, uh, uh, b by the way, Paul has a great article uh, linking to a bunch of very interesting um, works and articles, including one from HBR. I remember reading it and essentially the, the, when people talk about experimentation, they, the uh, waste comes uh, to their mind. They think it is useless because most of them are going to fail. Hmm. Hmm. Right. And uh, so that uh, creates a, an issue of uh, how do you uh, justify this in, in organizations? Uh, so the entire article, I think that was written by Dana Rodrick, if I'm not mistaken. I, I may have. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, yeah. Uh, it is being from this uh, page, by the way, event page for the audience. Um, uh, so the uh, where is the hesitation uh, for experimentation coming uh, in, in organizations? Yeah, so I'll just take a quick crack and then maybe Bhargava has an interesting answer here. But I would say that, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of half puzzled, half amused when I first read that. But I, I think it fundamentally comes down to we just don't like to know when we're wrong. Um, uh, it's uncomfortable. Um, and uh, when it, it sort of when you run experiments, I mean, he quotes this uh, Jeff Bezos, right, who talks about like the economics of this, of 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 making a lot of bets uh, because the ones that pay off pay off for everything. And that's how, you know, venture capital works and a lot of startups work as well, but it, it's true for bigger industry as well in terms of innovation and new product development. Um, but the thing is, is that that's not unique to experimentation. Uh, they're getting it, companies are getting it wrong all the time, regardless of whether they run experiments. Um, it's just experiments, let them learn it faster, which I think is very exciting. It's sort of, it lets you save time 
by figuring out where you're wrong faster uh, so that you can focus and refocus on the things and build and compound the things that work. Um, so, uh, so look, in, in the world we're in with so much change and with so much competition and the fact that everyone else is looking to satisfy the people you're doing business with, your customers, um, I, I think it's not really a choice. It's sort of, if you don't figure out how to run experiments in order to innovate, in order to offer, create new offerings and engage with people in a new world that they're in today, not the world they were in last summer or last year, um, then you will atrophy as a business. Um, yep. There's no other way around it. Actually, uh, Paul, you, you make such a good point um, because here is a way, experimentation as a, as a framework is a way to bound your losses rather than getting it wrong. You are able to define the scope of where you're experimenting rather than rolling out something and, and then realizing you know, that an experiment at scale didn't work. Rather, you're able to actually section off parts of what you're willing to stake so that you can, you can observe the effects and cap your downside. Is, does, that, does that jive with your, your sense of what experimentation looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Um, I, I do think uh, it would be really interesting because, you know, at, at some point, I hope we, hope we get to some of the technicalities of some of this stuff or, or just like the, the kind of rules or systems of thinking for this. Um, but um, I think it, it, it totally also depends on the, the kind of experimentation you're doing. So there's, there's like high level strategic experimentation where you're like, let's try this new thing. And then there's the kind of like, it, it's same with machine learning, right? Machine learning is really valid in a confined and constrained context. You don't do machine learning in order to figure out, um, you know, which strategic direction you're going as a business because you don't have data for that. And, and machine learning is about repeatable decisions that you have data for that you're trying to understand, right? There's some basic conditions for it. And experimentation is similar. To do it systematically uh, and technologically, the way I think both Bhargava's company and my company are doing, is, is it, you know, requires a certain context. And that's different than the everyday or like the, the higher level business experimentation. Uh, does that, uh, do you agree with that, Bhargava? Does that resonate? Absolutely, I totally agree. So uh, it'll just go back to, to one of the points that Wink just told a while ago. Uh, this being so much deep in the academic world, but not so much in the industry face, um, uh, I have a story to share. 100 years ago, there was this guy called William Gossett. So this guy, um, do you know the story, William Gossett? So, well, so, so Paul, obviously. So, okay. So, so this guy um, uh, was running, um, was in Dublin, was trying to make the best stout that's possible, beer that's possible. And the large scale experimentation was just not possible. I mean, he ran large production lines. Uh, so he and his colleague actually took one year off and then went and wrote what is now the seminal paper in statistics about called uh, the um, probability error of mean. Uh, we commonly know it as t-test. So, and he went and implemented this in Guinness. Guinness obviously is the world leader in beer. Guinness factory in Dublin is the most visited site in Europe. So when you have something like this, which uh, with small amount of data, do something that can wow the customers. Uh, it's, so it didn't, have, it didn't start with an academic place. It actually started in an industry, in a full plant. It's just that, um, like this is the point that Paul was also telling that, that for, for, for a number of years after that, it's just been buried in industry, except one field, which, which I think I'll come in a bit later, uh, except that it's predominantly been buried in academia and not so much in the industry. I think with the digital wave, people have been trying to do more of uh, uh, build more tools and do stuff around it to help improve stuff. Uh, this brings to the second point on economics. I, I, I think, I, I mean, th this is like, like the point that Paul just made about VC. So you need to make a lot of bets, but you have to be structured in how you do that. So one of the links which uh, he pointed in his blog post talks about experimental design and quasi-experimental design. Must read for anyone who runs, uh, not just data science, anyone who runs a business should read that. It's extremely important in how you think about taking bets, make informed decisions, and use that to grow your business. 
Interesting. There's a very I would thing. love to hear. Sorry, sorry, Venkata. But uh, if either Paul or Bhargava, just on that last bit, right? Because I think it would segue neatly into some of the more technical aspects of experimentation. Any, any uh, points from that post that come to mind that uh, people can take away if, if you if you know it, or shall we just assign it as reading material? I'm. I love I'm the word the read. I mean, that's right. amazing. Yes. <laughs> That's like home right. for everyone. All right. Venkata, you had a question? And we'll link it. Uh, we anyway link Paul's uh, article from the um, uh, from our event page. We'll link the other article as well. Uh, so my uh, uh, thinking was going towards um, uh, in, an, in an enterprise, right? Um, uh, there are some uh, preconditions, some stability and some structure for you to be able to do experiments. Where are the opportunities uh, in the enterprise to do the experiments and what have, uh, uh, which space has um, gathered more uh, momentum and which ones remain to be done, if you will. Any sense of the landscape? Sorry, maybe I'll go first, but uh, so one of the places where we really see experimentation at scale is in clinical trials, pharmaceutical companies. They are, uh, I mean, like this is the point that I was telling before, like they, that's one industry which, that's one part of an industry which has taken and has really established itself uh, doing large scale of uh, A-B testing, clinical trials to get drugs into the market. Uh, but the sad part is even if you, so, so, Few, a couple of years back, I consulted with one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so you, you, would, you would expect that the part of being mathematically and experimentally driven would permeate in all parts of the company. Unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. I mean, especially in the pharmaceutical world, maybe it's to do with regulations and compliance. Uh, but, but also, I, I see that a lot in other industries also. Manufacturing, yeah, we can talk, William Gossett, 100 years back, experimentation is quite uh, minuscule in, in the manufacturing industry. A lot of the things that still happens right now is... Uh, is in the uh, digital space. So marketing is one functionality which has really uh, led that stuff. And that's something that Paul and my company, both of us work in that specific space. Uh, but a lot of industries are just waiting to be disrupted. Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, so I would, I would say, um, you know, a lot of this, there's this, there's this great book, uh, the probability of chance or the chance of probability of the, the author's name is Ian hacking. He's done a lot of work on, on like the history of these things. And he has this quote about uh, the quiet statistician and like the mental models that are responsible, like that have changed our way of thinking and changed our world, but they don't get a lot of credit for it. And I would say that, you know, just quickly, I, I think there are actually a lot of industries where experimentation is incredibly important and useful. Um, I, I saw a statistic once uh, recently in the last couple of months, and it was about buying a car in the U.S. in the 70s. And when you, if you bought a car in the U.S. in the 70s, you had about a, right off the lot, right, a new brand new car, you had about a 20 to 30 percent chance of that car being a dud, of, of it being a lemon, such that you had to send it back to the manufacturer to get it to work. Um, you, th you think think about that like you you bought a new car for tens of thousands of us dollars or thousands of us dollars at least and it doesn't work and and that just doesn't happen today you would never experience that and and it doesn't happen for so many things i i, I just got a new um a dell um xps 13 a new laptop i was excited it's, it's ubuntu out of the box and there's some things about it that i wanted to explore and i shipped it from the us to singapore it was, it, it, it didn't work. And I was so shocked by that thing. Um, but the truth is, is that in, in general, when you spend money on and buying something that's been manufactured, you can pretty reliably trust that it'll work. And the reason is, is because experimentation, because these manufacturing lines 
have done so many things to figure out and optimize exactly what the flow is and to do, to make sure that they've eliminated as many bugs as possible from that process. And, and it is a lot of testing that's done in order to improve those processes. So it, it's kind of like, I think we take a lot of things for granted that 30 years ago would just not be a part of our world. And that's kind of amazing to think about. But, uh, but I wouldn't want to talk too much about that stuff because I don't think that's the world most of us live in. Where I'm really excited is, is in the world of tech, which is where I mostly spend my time, but it's also you know, the products that shape most of our lives, whether it's entertainment or, or, or transportation or delivery or, or e-commerce and shopping. In these spaces, I think there's, it's, it's ripe for so much to be done. And I say this as someone who spent my career in data science, um, is that I see so many young data scientists and, and, and people who you know, are training up and doing Kaggle uh, competitions and, and doing Coursera courses. And so much of that is focused on fitting random forests or, you know, you know, you know pulling data into a Jupyter notebook and doing analysis. And I think the, the really powerful thing is going to be, and, and then there's this sort of like this debate in this last 10 years, I think you guys even did a conversation about it, about how much is, is, is data science about modeling versus the engineering, right? Putting something into production means, pipelines and, 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 and software code and, and is it reliable, et cetera. Uh, and it's, that, it's, it's at that intersection and, and on the engineering side where I think there's some really amazing opportunities to do really good data science, uh, experimentation. Uh, but I do also think that we need a revolution and, a, and kind of a, a completely um, much more focus and attention on tools for this kind of thing. Because it's kind of the same way, you know, 10 years ago, when I, when I started, right, scikit-learn was a very new thing. And in fact, most data scientists were just starting to do R and they were doing R out of SAS and S and other tools. But um, the world now with Pandas and scikit-learn and all these libraries is completely different, right, in terms of the mm -hmm. work you have to do. And I think it's very similar for experimentation. There's a lot of things around sample size estimation and power estimation and just confounding, you know, a lot of the technical things maybe we'll get into a little bit later. But those methods, you need to learn about them. You need to learn about things like causal inference. But once you do that, and if, if we build tools to allow you to do that more effectively, then I think basically, I, I hope within five years, you're gonna see data scientists who are just looking everywhere within their company uh, for opportunities to create experiment layer, experimentation layers. And you know, this, uh, Paul, so this, this idea of tools for experimentation, um, it, it just sort of hits home so hard because it seems like at least, you know, a lot of the data science folks that we get to speak to, um, for some reason or the other, it seems like while they appreciate the value of, of doing experimentation, just because they have the background, they understand all of that. It is not that they're not aware of it, but because the investment hasn't been laid up front in both from a business perspective and for senior leaders to, to budget for experimentation, as well as for things in the tool chain, including processes to set up for experimentation, it usually ends up in my, my experience as being something that was done at the end to sort of get sign off or to get buy in. So when you talk about tools, it sounds, it sounds to me like the most important, I mean, it sounds to me like there's a concerted effort to build this into the culture of the organization. And I, I would love to hear a little bit about how you think about tools. I know because, you know, AMP is, is it's squarely in the middle of the space and Argava, your company, Binays as well. So a little bit about tools and why you thought that, you know, what you think is the intersection between actually building a tool and the culture that's needed at the data science company to actually implement that in their context? Any thoughts on this would be would be helpful. Yeah, I, I can go. Yeah, go go Margaret, ahead. Do you have thoughts? So I would just quickly say that, like, I'm a very practical person. I, I well, I like to think that, but I what I would say is I I, I completely agree that uh, that. Um, it, Data science and computational thinking and experimentation are, are, are about a mindset and they're about the way you approach decisions. Um, but I also think that they're somewhat derived from the practicalities of doing work. And, um, and so I, I've chosen to focus my participation in moving the world in this direction because I think it's a positive direction to move um, in the fact that in more bottom up work. So, you know, I, you know, I grew up in the U.S., but I've spent much of my career in India. And so, you know, there's lots of things there where I, I, I learned things about different kind of forms of hierarchy and organizational processes. In India, you know, you often hear and, and people will say businesses are very hierarchical. 
And so, and, and so there's this notion that like you get the boss to, to decide what's right and then the organization follows. And I think, you know, for sure that's true. It's true in the US as well to some degree. Um, but, um, but, but, but data scientists have the capacity and developers and software, technical people in general, I think, and product managers and others as well, they have the opportunity to influence the direction an organization goes goes. They're the experts in the methods. They're the experts in the work being done. And so, you know, the good ones and the creative ones and the ambitious ones aren't going to sit back and just sort of say, I'm going to do everything that is instructed, like the general direction, strategic direction, yes. But in terms of how they operationalize those guidelines uh, is up to them. And, and I think, so I, I see the future as coming from us as, you know, as workers or operators making better decisions and then the results of that floating up and then that changing minds. But in order to make that work, I think you need to have tools because you can't ask someone to like write everything from scratch and, and set everything up. That, that's risking too much. And so I think the best way to get change is to kind of create tools that everyday data scientists can take to demonstrate a better way to, in order to convince their managers or, or, or their company's leadership that that's a good direction to go in. So I'm a, much, a very big believer in bottom up. And I think in order to do that, you really need to, to, to make it possible to do. You have to create tools that enable, you know, these things to work better. And then the ideas will change, but. At, at Scribble, we have this idea of our metric uh, uh, called cost per question. Right. If the cost is very high for every single uh, question that you ask uh, about your behavior, your customer's behavior, uh, then it will automatically create an enormous amount of friction in uh, asking more questions and doing more of uh, this experimentation. And as the cost of the question keeps going down, suddenly our mind opens up to how many different kinds of questions and how many different ways uh, uh, we can ask. I mean, when you um, uh, Google, there was some number there which said that Google runs 10,000 experiments and all of this, these insane numbers uh, that are there, uh, that has all uh, become possible because it's lubricated by that very efficient experimentation system in a very systematic way. So, so uh, Ron Kohavi and others have uh, actually talked about it fantastically. Um, uh, uh, Bargava, you want to share your journey and your thoughts as well? So, so a couple of points here. One, uh, like, so I have one huge takeaway, but I'll break it down into three. The first one is now I'll do the other two a little later, but the first one I would say is about explore exploit framework, right? That's a very powerful framework to think about. If you think about the way business, any organization, data science, marketing, supply chain, operations, human resource, doesn't matter any organization, any functional unit within a company, uh, they're all optimized to exploit at any given moment in time. But as humans, it's, that's how we also evolve, that you, you always need to explore a bit and then exploit. So unless you explore, you wouldn't understand more of what's happening in your business, in your customers, in your data, in your processes. Uh, like this is famous, Data is just a means to the end truth, right? I mean, it's a very, very oft repeated uh, saying uh, because data, whatever data you see is also not probably very accurate. There's measurement error. There's also the setting in which the data was obtained. Uh, there's this whole concept of dark data, data that is not visible, which we don't have access to at all, which influences the process, which means that all of this, even if you think that, as I mean, at this day and age, I don't see any company which is there proclaiming that we are not a data-driven company. Every company wants to use data to do it. We no longer are in the education phase of this evolution where we need to educate the importance of data, but importance of experimentation, definitely, yes, because this concept of explore, exploit is not something that comes natural for a lot of people. Paul made a great point. That's true with my kids also that, that anything that you see, the first thing that goes into the mouth and then they learn very quickly, right? I mean, that's, that's them taking bets, figuring out, oh, this is food and this is not food. And then over time, so in a very similar way, companies should also do that. This is not happening right now because of uh, extremely, uh, limited set of tool set that's out there. Uh, so tool, so, the point of cost 
of a question, a very similar thing is cost of running an experiment is something that my customers ask me all the time. Uh, it's so unfortunate because anytime you run an experiment, you learn more. That's a lot more valuable than associating a negative connotation of cost with it, right? So th that's that's a disservice that I would I should put my neck out and tell that all the existing players in the market have actually done that way. That it's probably more fear-inducing rather than uh, a way which. Uh, it, it, I like the way Paul told, like moving the world in a positive direction. Experimentation is a way to move the world positively towards because you understand, you create better mental models and you start exploiting it. Uh, tools that are there currently in the market, for example, there's only one unicorn in the space, uh, Optimizely, and uh, it's clearly targeted towards extremely large enterprises. You need an army of uh, statisticians to work and implement it. It's non-trivial for a normal business user. So the moment, so for example, I specifically target really small and small to medium-ish uh, e-commerce customers. And they're like, okay, this is like experimentation. Oh yeah, we read about it. Uh, we were told about this by our mentor, but I don't think we are ready for it because the tools are extremely expensive. The tools are extremely complex. I can't go spend thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars hiring people, hiring tools, setting up infrastructure. Uh, I think uh, the tools that are needed to drive this is still in its infancy. And I think we need a lot more people building this ecosystem out. So for both Bhargava and Paul, um, I, I know that you know marketing, uh, the, the marketing domain within larger organizations is a is a core focus for both of you. Um, whether it is from the communication side, meaning how customers interface or the companies converse with their customers, or any other aspects of marketing, could you just help us understand some standard methods of how uh, a data science team might set up experimentation? Because what I'd love to understand is the shelf life of the learning of this experimentation, meaning when a data science team is doing all of this, how should they think about doing it? Not just the one time, but as a, as, as something as they build into their process for subsequent things, maybe it ties into the cost per question as well. Paul, you're on mute if you're speaking. Yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, cost yeah. Per, per question, I think is a great concept, a great way to frame it. Um, yeah, so the <clears throat> this kind of connects the, is a nice segue from tools. I would say so. So when we think about experimentation, for me, it's it's just to, you know, to like reconfirm it. Sort of ten or twenty years ago, if you looked at the number of companies that were doing machine learning and production as part of some aspect of their product, it would be very few. And now it's become more democratized because of tools. Uh, and, and and more downstream and long tail of companies can do it. I, I think similarly with experimentation. Um, and so, 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 so now there's these companies that are sort of in this space. I think marketing is an interesting place um, where there are tools that sort of, you know, give token um, acknowledgement to experimentation and they build capacity to do certain things. And I would just give some examples here of, of where I think there's gaps and where, and where the problem there is in the, in the direction of, of, of making this possible and in the direction of figuring out this question of like how long is a is a an insight worthwhile so a b testing is often kind of used as a placeholder for experimentation which i think is a is a shame because it's not a b testing is one limited use kind of case of experimentation uh it's an important one it, it, it's a good thing but it's definitely not everything that experimentation involves but a b testing is a tool and it can often be used quite poorly and it can often be quite misleading. And, and part of the problem is because the tool doesn't really help in a lot of ways with some of the core aspects of what you need to do it well. So an A-B test, let's just kind of like, I'm sure everyone's familiar with it, but we would just review, right? An A-B test is basically referring to saying, all right, we're gonna try two versions. Let's say we're sending a message to users and we've got message A and message B. Um, and we wanna see which, which one works. Um, and A-B testing is sort of just saying, well, let's send messages uh, to users with you know, send message A and send message B. And it's based on this concept. And usually what the tool lets you do is, is randomize the assignment. And what that means is that um, you're from your pool of, let's say, a thousand users. There's nothing, there's nothing that should influence 
about those users that should influence their assignment to message A group or message B group. That's great. In and of itself, it's great. Uh, and it's an important part of, uh, part of the test. But what it doesn't solve, because randomization is just sort of saying there's nothing, there's nothing affecting your assignment. But when you get the results back, the inference you're trying to make is if there's a difference in the mean like conversion rate for those two groups, the question is, 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 is it that because you're making an inference about causation, that the reason there's a difference there is because message A or message B is better. And the huge problem with that, with that inference and taking away that insight is that um, you, you almost certainly, your tool did not help you handle confounding. What confounding means is just that um, there is a bunch of other information about you that characterizes your users. This is stuff that would be in your CRM, for example. Uh, age, uh, you know, how long they've been on the site, uh, how many products they've bought, uh, average uh, purchase value in the past six months. You know, just many, many data things that we would use to fit a model or do other interesting data science things on it. And those all interact with the likelihood of converting, right? We're just gonna get technical here for a minute. If you take any one of those, you can kind of make an assumption or make an inference that in some cases that's influencing the propensity to buy. That someone who's been, who's purchased a higher amount in the last month is more likely to continue purchasing, right? And so the issue is, is when you do random ass assignment for a simple A-B test, what you end up having is imbalance in these other features. So I have assigned 500 users to message A and 500 to message B and but because I've ran, done it randomly and I haven't taken into consideration the ARPU for that user in the past month, then I'm gonna have imbalance. It's kind of like if the four of us were playing poker or, or some other card game and we randomly shuffled the cards, um, even if the deck was completely randomly shuffled and then we assigned a hand to each of us, there'd be a strong likelihood that, I mean, it's very unlikely that we all have even hands. Someone's gonna get a better hand. And so similarly, one of those groups, message A or message B, is going to have a higher average R, you know, R proof, for example, for the customers in that group. And so then when you're trying to take away the question of like a week later and you're looking at conversion, you see message A has a higher conversion rate. But if it has this other demographic feature or this other feature of the group that's different than message B, now, you're, you're forced, now you don't know. Is it because of message A or is it because that feature had higher representation in, in that group? And so... You know, this is this concept of confounding. And if your tool doesn't help you handle that, and there's, like, there's ways to do it, but it's a pretty tricky problem. Um, another, another example. No, just, so, Paul. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask. It sounds, what you said right now, right? I mean, uh, there are going to be so many variables in the setting up of a good experiment, constraining it in the, in the healthy ways that you're talking about. How much of this you think can be driven by a tool versus having a really good judgmental human in the loop. So I, because you've, yeah. made choice, you've made a choice, you're an entrepreneur today that's building a tool in this space. Um, how much of it are you looking to offload to the tool versus how much needs to be in the hands of thinking data scientists at that organization, customer organization? Yeah. Um, did we have a disclaimer that uh, I haven't paid you guys? It sounds like you're like, you're setting me up for a, for a win here, Indra. <laughs> um, no, 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 go for it, go for it. <laughs> Seriously. No, I, I think there's amazing things that you can do if, if, if your tool sets you up. There's much better uh, inferences, more reliable inferences you can make. And remember, data science is not a deter it's not a 100% game. It's a game of probabilities. So it's, you're not about being 100% confident in your inference. It's about, can you shift your confidence from you know 60 to 65 percent and that can translate into really significant amount of revenue for your business um, and I think it that is entire it is you know extensively a question of, um, of, of is your tool helping you handle some of these methods and some of these sort of technical and statistical problems the other one which I think is even a better example is related to you know what Barger was saying about an explore exploit trade-off uh, to do experimentation well and to like get your conversion rate, you know, and have a good ROI is also a question of efficiency. And so if I have a thousand users and I assign 500 to message A and 500 to message B, if message A is end up being better, then I've wasted 500 users sending them message B. Yeah. Could I have learned that message A was better 
with 100 users in each group or 150 users in each group? Because that would have saved, like you can then take the improved improvement in conversion and multiply it by all the people in your B group. And that's, an, again, significant lift. So can you have a tool that let, lets you kind of monitor your assignment to groups, monitor conversion, especially if let's say it's a link in a message or you know, it's a checkout, um, and actually efficiently sample. And then that kind of brings me to your, your, your original question, which I'm sorry it took me so long to get to, but which is how long uh, is an insight good for? And I would say in today's world, probably not long, which is why it's so important that experimentation is a continuous like systematic part of your process. And in order to do that, you have to have it set up well. Because you know, in this, I talked to so many companies, you know, some of the best ones you can think of in India, right? The ones that have raised the most money, right? Like I, I talked to many of them and they'll do things like set up a new feature, launch it at the beginning of the quarter, they do an A-B test. And then they decide that they, they learn that a message works better than another one or a particular flow works better than another one. And then they'll use that and then they'll set that. But then they're overwhelmed with so many other things, right? As a, any business is going to be have way more to do than it has time to do. And so they'll keep that flow for the next six, eight months, a year. And what's the chance that the message or the flow that worked, you know, in January works for you around Diwali in October? Not, not much, right? But you can't go back and you're learning, you know, when does the seasonality change? When does the world change? When does the competition happen? And so you really need to be continuously running experiments, not just at the beginning of the quarter. Uh, but if it's a manual effort, you probably can't afford to because the cost per question is too high. If it becomes more automated or more tools doing it, you bring the cost per question down. Now you can do it, you can learn more and you get ROI for it. This ties in nicely with the question that has come on YouTube uh, from Ankit Dubey. Uh, probably Bhargava can take this. Uh, can you build off uh, what uh, Paul was saying and talk about the experimentation uh, design process? Um, Paul talked about, uh, for example, repeatedness of this. And uh, uh, can you talk about uh, feasibility or some planning, whether, the, um, uh, whether you have the right data to be able to make that assessment uh, and so on? Uh, experiment design process. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll take some, uh, so that's a good question. Uh, so I'll, I'll take some examples that I've done in the past, right? So, so two, uh, so not in the current company, but before I've done two major places where uh, it was entirely driven on uh, experimentation. One is recommendation systems, personalization engine, right? So when you build recommendation systems to drive, and this is for, uh, regional uh, content app that I was helping them build recommendation systems and uh, the entire consumption was based just on uh, what was personalized for that particular user. So no two users saw the same screen. Uh, it was just content that came and that's the only thing that they could consume, which means that the, the objective was to increase engagement in that particular platform. And that was the metric KPI that the business owners were looking at. Now, when you have something like that, you have, I mean, obviously you can build hundred diff hundreds of different types of recommendation systems, right? From simple uh, similarity-based stuff to content, collaborative filtering to complex deep learning models. It's a whole bunch of whole array of uh, models that can be built. Uh, but they're all built, as I told, on, on engagement that happened before. So if you want to do something in practice, one of the things that you would do or things that I have done is, is segment your users in a appropriate way. So create, uh, for example, if you run Facebook campaigns, it lets you create audience ways. So in which you'll have to create smart audiences, uh, sometimes rule-based, uh, some, if you want uh, users have very specific interest, the business users want it built in a specific way, or sometimes in just use, use statistical machine learning models to segment your specific users and then run different models on it, use the inference, and then start working towards improving it. Uh, just in terms of technique, one of the things that has really worked for me is multi-arm bandits. So, uh, so you have multiple bandits and then you do this explore exploit framework and see which works better. So it helps you. One thing is 
this being just recommendation driven, the test is running all the time. So which means that uh, for the company, it's just the continuous progression of test that keeps happening. Users preference obviously keeps changing because what's hot, what's new content that they have bought, everything impacts the specific uh, usage. Uh, but then that's typically one step where you use that and you use different cohorts to see uh, which kind of recommendation models work. Um, I mean, Netflix has written some amazing articles around it. We tried doing something similar. So artwork, experimenting with different images that someone can see based on the time of the day for a particular segment. Uh, so those are, those are examples of how specific uses where this would be used, but this could just be used to drive engagement. Maybe Paul can give a um, slightly more uh, structured breakup of this design process itself, whether it is uh, selection of the data, evaluating whether it is, um, um, uh, uh, you know, whether it has the quality and the, the signal and the collection process is not corrupted and so on. Assessment yeah. of the readiness of the data, the selection of the problem, actually. Yeah. I'd be happy to. Yeah, I would sort of say there's two aspects of this that I think have to do with uh, the experiment design process and, and, and how you can use kind of like kind of institutionalize or, or, or put it in into technology, into a tool, which is what we're focusing a lot on at AMP uh, and which we've done with some of our early customers and which I'd done at my previous company at, uh, where I was working with, with many telcos and messaging their prepaid users, subscribers. And, and the two aspects are, the first is you know, coming back to this example of conditioning that I talked about and confounding. Uh, conditioning is the way you deal with confounding. Um, and when you design an, an experiment, what you're trying to do, if you don't do it naively in the sense of just randomly assigning without looking at any underlying features of those users, uh, is, is conditioning. You're sort of saying, condition. so, so I'm gonna tr in, a, in a sense, naively, I'm going to balance um, these variables that matter. But then you kind of come to Indra's problem, which is you have too many variables that matter. And one of the things I like to do and like to emphasize, you know, as a data scientist is that a lot of the times we should be ignoring data, right? Like that's a bit, uh, you should ignore your data. And what, the reason that is, is because you have, um, you can get much of the data that you have that's about humans is duplicative. It's, 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 it's a duplicate, right? It's, there's high correlations, intercollinearities and other things like that, where basically, uh, one piece and one another piece, two snapshots can end up giving you the same insight about the fundamental that you, you care about, which is the probability of converting. And so in that case, to balance over both of those features uh, would be kind of um, exponentially expensive for you versus reducing that by recognizing it uh, and, and simplifying. So this is sort of dimensionality reduction. So dimensionality reduction plays a huge role in good experiment design um, by letting you efficiently find the data that matters. And the cool thing about this is there's an opportunity to learn both about your metric, but also about your users. I think this is what's so powerful about this is that um, you can learn two things. You can learn one, that your message was more effective or which message was more effective. And two, you can learn which, aspect, which segments of your population have a higher baseline propensity to consume or to purchase or to convert. And that itself is, you know, is really useful. Um, even if you find it wasn't your message that did it, it was that this particular segment of users is highly likely. That means you can target those users going forward. You can figure out and fix your product, which is why actually I, I, I think for AMP, we're, we're definitely not just focused on marketing. We actually think that this is a tool that product managers can use uh, because it's, a, it's about making a better product. So that's, you know, that's one aspect is this sort of the dimensionality reduction Ooh. side and the conditioning side of experiment design. Yeah, one other, yeah, one, one other one I just want to quickly go over is, is that then there's the, there's the question of how can you calibrate the thing that you're trying to test, right? So a lot of times when, again, when we do naive A-B tests, we, we are testing a message and a message, like message A and message B. Um, and then what you find out after it's done is that message B is better or whatever, right? Uh, but as a product manager, or as a business owner, or as, a, as a person who cares about some aspect of your business, you don't really care about message A or message B. 
you care about the mechan the fundamental, the, the trigger that's within the message. So take a message, and if you decompose it, what you end up having is, what do you say in the message? Do you have a value proposition? You might embed an incentive. You might embed evidence. Uh, you might have a call to action, right? So think about it, the value proposition might, like at PaySense, we, we're all often asking whether our users cared about, were, were they coming to us for loans? Because, uh, because we are convenient, as in you can just do it through the app, you don't have to go to the bank, or because our prices are low, uh, you know, low interest rates, or is it because it's speed, right? The money goes into your bank right away, right? So if I, you know, a messaging user to get them to come back and complete their application, which of these should I focus on? Or if I'm offering an incentive as an e-commerce site, do, should I be emphasizing, you know, you know, a discount on my next purchase or a free giveaway, right? And so all of a sudden you start to realize that in a message, you've got all these levers you can pull, all these things you can calibrate and toggle in order to maximize the effectiveness of your tool, of your instrument with which you're engaging your users. But in order to do that, right, you need to have a clean process. You need to have a clean experiment design process that lets you sort of say, all right, here's a library or a catalog of different levers that I can pull in my messages. And how can I systematically track those and systematically vary them over time so that I can learn over time? Because you're not going to figure it all out in one A-B test. Mm -hmm. Again, I just want to drill home this point. You're not going to learn everything in one test. You have to keep doing it. Um, and so to me, that's... A, you know, a, a core fundamental part of the experiment design process is making a structure to your thinking and making a structure to your testing so that you're cumulatively learning. You're not just learning shallowly at breadth. You know, I've tested a million different messages, but each of those has no connection to the other because they're just blobs. No, deconstruct it, make it levers that you can actually cumulatively build on. And that's a, like a powerful way to use experiment design. Talking about the, the conditioning, um, one of the questions the, that I had was uh, maybe Barbara can address what if there are hidden processes and variables that are impacting uh, the outcome, the number of columns that you have uh, in your database, you can condition against them. What if there are variables beyond, uh, beyond them? I think in the case of Bhargavas, you, you don't even know the demographics, right? Of your, when you're doing this. Uh... No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. So, uh, well, so, okay, so let me, so let's take a step back on how, the, to the point of Paul was telling about experimental design itself. I think there needs to be a lot more structured process in how the experiment itself is run. So for example, if you're going to run so one is the process itself, right? The second thing could be the campaigns. For example, I run a Facebook campaign. So are you able to segment it better? Are you able to get as much of the uh, features that are needed to be in place? Uh, but then unfortunately, you wouldn't know everything in one or even 10 tests. It, it's, it's a people's choice changes, business evolves, and then this data keeps changing over a period of time. So that's, uh, so there's an interesting concept called uh, Fritkin's paradox, which basically tells that if there are two equally attractive options, it doesn't matter what choice you make. So if you're going to tell oh, which shade of blue am I going, will maximize conversion, I mean, okay, it's not a great uh, A-B test. We can't claim, oh, I have done an A-B test with different shades of blue, and this is what Maxim is. That's probably spurious in my opinion, but, but it, it, the value that it adds is going to be so low. Also, one reason why you have so many SaaS sites looking so similar these days, right? So people have figured out, oh, this is like, well, proven, so let's go. Only the exploitation keeps happening. Exploring doesn't happen, which means you also don't know what, what else would work, right? So that's that's one of the biggest challenges. But yes, also right. when you talk about uh, Facebook advertising, the uh, Facebook is the hidden process. They have their algorithms that will keep uh, distributing and redistributing based on their uh, internal logic. How reliable are the, are the results? of what is again goes back to the shelf life and how, how should we understand the outcomes of experiments when these kinds of huge processes are involved. But, but aren't these, like, like what Paul told, these insights don't carry weight for much longer time. It, it's going to be continuously evolving, but, but we are just talking about one aspect of it, which is out, from outbound to inbound, right? But there's a lot more things that can happen. So think about 
think about the impact. So the reason I want to drive this home is that the impact that a specific experimentation can drive can change from industry to industry. For example, in clinical trials, experimentation is make or break. So if you take about the, the, a drug from the time it starts in the lab conception to becoming break even, it takes anywhere between 10 to 14 years, right? And say something like a performance marketer, entirely say a marketing led e-commerce company. I mean, it, it's probably a matter of hours before something else, a new shiny toy comes up and then they go. So we are looking at two different ends of the spectrum and look at something like a startup where startups need limited access to people, limited access to talent, resources, money. You'll have to do experimentation to see which side you have to go and you can't go all in. You're going to make uh, uh, educated guess and educated bet in one direction and then you're going to keep getting better at it. And this is how, so think about building any product, any tool as a series of bets, which is just experiment driven. Um, that's all I'd say. There's a fantastic book by Annie Duke. Uh, I don't know if you thinking in bets. Uh, oh yeah, thinking in, yeah, yeah. Yes. I highly recommend to. Oh, poker. Yeah, it's a brilliant book. Yes. I. I think I think we it's uh, we are about you know, you, uh, but I do want to ask one last question to sort of bring this all together, which is I think we've talked about you know the clear need for experimentation. We've talked about uh, some of the ways that we would go about doing this. My question would be that from a top-down perspective, and Paul, this is not not the bottom up that you were talking about, but from a top-down perspective, what I mean by that is getting uh, getting leadership on board, getting the organization set up to build. Uh, experimentation into their process. Are there, in your experience as business people, um, are there any methods, any uh, any ways that you've thought about how to prepare an organization and their infrastructure to enable this experimentation? Do you talk about the benefits or or do you, do you just assume that uh, at some point they're going to see that it is part of the rigor necessary? How do you sell experimentation? I'll just, you know, I'll add one more thought here. And the reason I, I ask this question is because a lot of our audience is our people who want to do the right thing, who want to take a very measured approach to being able to do this. And they have to manage upwards as well. So any thoughts on, on how best that they can do this to build that culture of experimentation in uh, would be a nice way to sort of tie a ribbon on this. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, so when I... When, you know, I started my career, and I refer back to this, I started my career in the U.S. Department of Defense, and I was, it was a small team that they just set up to do large-scale computational modeling for irregular conflict, irregular warfare, so places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and so most of my work was very systematic, but it often was used as material to make higher strategic decisions, and, and so it would, I would get sucked in that direction. And for a while there, I, I kind of paid more attention to this world of sort of policy and like you know, sort of national decisions and things like that, which I think are analogous in many ways to senior levels of the business. Uh, and there was this, there's this movement towards, um, towards um, moving away from just like speculation and hand waving and towards sort of saying, can we be more rigorous and more data driven and more you know, empirical? And one way of doing that was sort of saying, um, putting your prediction down or putting your forecast down or putting something down and then sort of seeing what happens. And that to me is also a great way to lay the foundation for experimentation because what it means is we believe this is gonna happen. We, we think that this is gonna happen. So when you say that, when you put it down, you have an opportunity to learn whether you're right or wrong and you can learn why were you right or wrong. But you also have an opportunity to go ahead and try and suggest a possible alternative. So is there some way you can carve out space, let's say if you're making an organizational decision, to sort of say, well, can we, is there any way we can split our group or kind of create some opportunity to try something different? Um, and, and then evaluate it a little further down the road. And I think that you know, creates space for experimentation and it sort of, it, it sort of helps you realize that how, how you know, non-revolutionary it can be as a first step 
but how kind of what an incredible impact it can have. Uh, it doesn't have, you don't need to turn your business upside down. You don't need to change everything that you're doing. Um, but you can make these small kind of small directional changes and maybe it, it'll change significantly where you are as a business two or three years from now. It's sort of like two, yeah. two lines emerging from a, uh, from a point. Uh, they start very close together, but the distance, but, but that should hopefully be a great thing, a good thing. So, um, so that's, you know, my thought there. Very nice. Bhargava, any closing thoughts from you? I, I mean, I, I, would, I would say that think about explore, exploit framework, mm -hmm. testing all the time. It definitely pays off. Think about um, just the same referring to what, emphasizing what Paul told that uh, think entire process perspective, not an individual, don't be in a silo, think from an entire process perspective. I think the payoff is a lot more when it comes to that. And think about organizational change as a series of structured bets. Experiment with it. Very nice. So gentlemen, I mean, we are, we're at uh, a minute past seven. We've just reached our closing time. Thank you so very much for having attended. Uh, there will be comments that we expect on our page and we will relay those to you. But if they were to look for, for you on the net, what is a good way for them to get in touch with you? Maybe your Twitter handles if you guys are active there. Bhargava, uh, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, tw Twitter is the best way to reach me. Uh, my first name, B-A-R-G-A-V-A. -A -A. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Wonderful. Paul, how should people get in touch with you? Yeah, so I'm also on Twitter. You can, uh, it's at uh, P, my, the first initial of my first name, and then M E I N S, so the first uh, five letters of my last name, at P Mainz. Um, but I'm also um, you know, on LinkedIn, and I, I think my email is just generally out there, so I'm, I'm happy to, to chat. We will be adding both of your Twitter handles to the uh, page as well, so people can find them from the event uh, page. Uh, yeah, Indra. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. And I will tell the audience that, uh, of course, this is session number five for us. And with each of these sessions, we usually catalog a bunch of takeaways. And you can find those on hasgeek.com slash fifth elephant under the archives of making data science work. We'll have the notes up on for this session as well there. Uh, with that, thank you everyone for having joined. And thank you to all of the, the audience members that listened in as well. One last announcement. Um, the upcoming uh, session, the next uh, session of uh, making data science work, we will be discussing uh, again about tools, but this time uh, uh, it will be on tools for operationalizing fact, fairness, uh, accountability, and transparency. We have two couple of fantastic panelists like the ones that we have right now uh, to talk about uh, how they're thinking about this whole space. Um, Overall, we are a big believer in a very disciplined approach to data science and uh, it just continues the, the thread that we have been on. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Great.